Welcome to our uh, our uh, squat clinic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like such a reaction, Brenda. <laughs> today, today we're gonna go deep on the squat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to start with some, uh, we're going to go from 60,000 feet to 10,000 feet to one inch in terms of uh, perspective. So we're talking about the purpose of the squat um, and the squat pattern, why we squat, <clears throat> what is involved um, in your anatomy, and, uh, what's affecting your body, how we use it in the program, and different ways to program the squat, and then the common problems with the squat and common solutions, <clears throat> where we'll get into that practically um, and get into our own personal squats today, and get the reps in. So, we'll start from the beginning. Um, why do we squat? What are, the, what are the reasons that we squat in training for warriors or, or in fitness in general? Does anybody? What? Core. Core strength, cool, yeah. Uh, independence, later in life, being able to go to the bathroom. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So going down to a toilet yeah. 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 And, and, uh, older populations, your lifespan is directly correlated with your ability to squat and your stride. Ability to be independent. We right. also think it's good because it helps your mood. Yeah. 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 Yes. Debut. <laughs> to quote uh, Dr. Love. Um, to pick up dogs, kids, boxes. Functional. functional. Actually useful in your everyday life. Uh, all those are correct. Um, the squat is, if you look at um, lifting inside of the gym and then in the weight room, whether you're talking about a volleyball team or a football team or a, a track team, um, the squat has the heaviest or the highest correlation with overall athletic performance, whatever the sport. So if someone can uh, squat well and squat a lot of weight, they're going to be a more productive lineman. They're going to be a faster track athlete. They're going to be a, um, a more aggressive setter or blocker in volleyball. Um, all these things uh, are, are, are correlated because the squat, not because of, well, the squat is kind of special. It casts a long shadow. We're gonna get into anatomy in a second, but in order to squat well, you must have stability, mobility, strength, and power. And uh, there's, a, it not only tests those things, but it produces those things. So um, the more athletic you are in the gym, in the squat, the greater you are able to apply your body to everything else that you're doing uh, in general. So, uh, in functional medicine, they say that squat, cast a long shadow. Now we'll talk about anatomy and physiology. What's involved in a squat? Well, if you've been here training for warriors for more than a day, you'll probably think that everything is involved in a squat if you've ever been coached by me. So uh, for everything from your lats to your abs, obliques, internal and external, uh, rectus abdominis, pelvic floor muscles, transverse abdominis, Glutes, hips, uh, from head to toe, are actually going to be part of the kinetic chain that are going to help you squat. So, essentially everything. But we're going to get into anatomy, anatomy and physiology a little bit more deeply because um, not all squats look the same. And I'm um, going to get some volunteers up here. Let's get a Viviana. Did you expect such a reaction? <laughs> and uh, let's get, okay, so, and then we'll do uh, Viviana and I. Let's go back to back so we can't really look at each other, because, um, so you get on the, the same mic. So we have different arms, like, limb lengths, and, like, we're gonna squat, I don't want to get knocked over. We're going to squat this summer. Appropriate, but we'll just we'll stick with it. Uh, so I'm going to uh, figure this behind the ears. We're going to squat down and we're going to look at this, like the, the geometry and how our, our backs are and then everything else. So all the way down to the bottom, Viviana. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. So um, our knee position is different. Our, uh, our width is different. Our back angle is different. 
and everything, even though I'm gonna assume that maybe I'm squatting correctly because I've seen us do it a thousand times, right? Torso lengths differ, femur lengths, shin lengths differ. Um, so the squat isn't like a, um, there's not a prescription for what it must look like. It must feel good. It must utilize your whole body in an effective way. Um, and the, the greater the range of motion squat depth, which is something we talk about a lot, that will recruit more muscle fibers, allow you to use more, get more hip drive, uh, which is a term that strength coaches use all the time, but it just means it's recruiting your center to do the work, uh, the deeper that you're squatting. So the more, the higher you're, literally the physically, the higher you're squatting, the less muscles you're, you can use, ergo the less productive every rep is. So aside from some qualitative differences, there's not a right way to do it, so long as you're not damaging yourself and you're, um, and you're feeling good as a But <clears throat> we're gonna get into the common problems in a second because that has heavily to do with how we use our anatomy a, on a daily basis and ways that don't help us. Um, and uh, uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, so we're still kind of anatomy, physio anatomy physiology and what we're, why we squat. So <clears throat> this is the metabolic um, nervous system spectrum. So what this is, is um, you guys kind of notice the different training feels differently. We have strength days, we have training four years, we have metabolic days, hurricane days. And the more repetitions or time under tension that you get, the more cardiovascular demanding, the more metabolically demanding, the more muscle fibers are demanded in that particular exercise. And the fewer reps, the heavier the weight or the faster that you're going. So if you're doing a 1RM on the squat, we're doing a squat jump, right? It's very difficult to do 30 really good squat jumps, probably because you just puke, because that's, that's a lot of intensity very, very quickly. But um, the, the, the fewer the reps, the higher the intensity, and the higher the speed, the more demanding it is of your nervous system. But it's a spectrum. Everything that you do on, on the spectrum, every piece of training is training your nervous system, and it's training your heart, and it's training your muscles, but the, the rep count, the timing, the speed, the purpose, and the, the function of the drill affects exactly where it falls on the spectrum. So um, doing sets of three, right, moves you slightly down the spectrum, doing sets of five, slightly further down, doing sets of 10, 15, 20, right? They're all a little bit different, but um, our homework last month was doing sets of 20 on the goblet squat, right? Well, even though that was very meta meta metabolic impact immediately, the practice of getting that, that movement pattern, um, uh, getting those reps in that high quality movement pattern, um, elevates your strength and allows you to recruit more motor neurons more quickly in that pattern because it becomes familiar. And you actually get stronger even though you're doing a, a rep count of 20. So all that is to say that we're always training everything, but every scheme and drill and focus, focus point has a different outcome that we're gonna get on the backside as long as we're doing high quality work on the front side. And there's not a best, there's just a different purpose for a different lift for a different day. Okay, any questions so far? I'm kinda of going quickly, but I wanna to get to the squatting. Um, <clears throat> all right, now, here's my anatomy man. Common problems with the squat. So um, people think sometimes that squatting hurts their knees. People think that squatting hurts their back. Um, the knee is a dumb joint. It doesn't, they, we create problems in our knees from having a poor squat, which we're gonna address today, because I've done that. I've hurt my knees from getting a bad squat over and over and over again. But um, the, the knee is not really involved that much in the squat. It bends to allow you to recruit a bunch of quads and hamstrings. That's really all that happens for the knee. The back is a little bit more vulnerable in the squat, um, but I circled in this dotted line of this area. This is where most of the problems originate from. Everything between the thigh and the nipples, so the belly button and out. The, the, the center of your body is, is uh, the amplifier for the music that is your nervous system. So if I'm trying to squat and I don't have my core engaged, I'm not gonna get all the parts in the chain that play well together. So what will happen is, if my core isn't engaged and, and properly amplified, then my hip isn't gonna help my femur stay stabilized as I drop into the, 
as they drop into the squat because there's no intrinsic recruitment or tension, torque, depending on what, you know, what your man, physical mechanism you're talking about. But um, oftentimes we create problems from, uh, in our bodies from doing these poor reps um, and that manifest in things like painful knee, tight hip, tight low back, um, uh, even, you know, even ankle problems. Um, an, ankle, an ankle problem is probably the most common thing that I see in a squat that is preventing somebody from doing really good work, meaning that they don't have the ankle mobility to allow that knee to translate forward. But when you take somebody uh, out of the squat and you just have them stretch their ankle and stretch their foot, usually the mobility is there. They can't access it while they're squatting because of core recruitment or practice. And oftentimes when it comes to um, uh, problems with exercise, it isn't that the body can't. Now if you've had a surgery, Jennifer just left, but she had a labral tear, had a surgery, she had a knife cutting apart muscles and ligaments and interrupting you know, movement patterns, yes, you will not be able to do that. So you have to get repaired, that has to get repaired, you must get re-educated through physical therapy and time to then be able to do it. But um, in, that's infrequently the case. Most of the time it's motor education and the way that we walk around during the day half asleep in our own bodies that creates these problems. So uh, we're gonna be doing a lot of different drills today to get that squat dialed in and to make it feel really, really good. All right, that's the theory part portion. That's the academic portion. Does anybody have any questions on the who's, the what's, the when's, the where's, the why's, the how's, or has like, like a problem that uh, I didn't talk about or something on their mind around their own squat that I didn't already address? Two questions. Go. One, you talked a little bit about the breath. Yeah. And then, or, yeah, okay, whatever. Of course. And then the other one is depth. How do you know where that sweet spot is? Uh-huh, absolutely. So, um, the breath is, uh, these, are, these are kind of related, but the breath is an integral part of getting your core recruited properly. And by breath, I don't mean holding your breath. I mean <laughs> being able to breathe while maintaining a nice, tense, and active abdominal wall. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today because 90% of the time, we don't have a hip problem or a knee problem or an ankle problem. What we have is the inability to maintain and keep core tension long enough to, or, or consistently enough to allow our body to move as a unit. And so we're gonna do some exercises right after this that are gonna demonstrate how good it feels to have your core on, because we're gonna use some tricks and some leverage to make it impossible to not use your core. And then you're gonna see like, oh wow, there's a lot going on in here uh, once everything is activated that makes squatting feel really good. And it's just now they're carrying that over to our actual training. And the next piece is squat depth. How do you know uh, what the right sweet spot is? Well, number one, um, your squat depth is like the, the limit that you can take it without causing pain and without losing the tension and the recruitment of everything else in the body. So if you, if you have a, you know, a, an impinged, fever and that you're feeling like a stabbing pain in the front of your hip when you're squatting, then you squat above that pain threshold. So you don't want to create a pain event through your own movement. Uh, and then aside from that, if you don't have any pain, then you want to always, all things being equal, when we're doing strength training, we want every movement to find the limit of our range of motion and hopefully expand it. So when, when we're squatting, when I'm squatting, I'm, when I'm doing a goblet squat or a barbell back squat or whatever, what I'm really interested in because, you know, unless I'm testing my squat, it doesn't need to be the most I could possibly lift. What I'm really interested in is every rep working against that tension that I have naturally in my own hips, trying to expand and go deeper uh, with every rep that I get, leaning against my own limitations of my range of motion. And today we're gonna feel a little bit of that, hopefully, as we get into our squatting. And so you can see like, oh, like this is where my body wants to stop. And now I'm going to find that depth threshold every time, hopefully take it 1% further. Because as we're about to discover, your body and your brain wants to be calorie efficient. So we'll always try to shave effort off of your movement. You know, you see people at other gyms, of course not our gym, but you see people at other gyms doing shallow push-ups 
they, one time they did a real push up and then in their mind, that's what they think is happening. What's happening is their brain is consistently shaving off an inch over the course of a couple weeks and then another inch. And pretty soon they're barely moving, but in their mind they're doing a full that push up because the same thing is happening to us if we're not watching each other, right? Or you don't have that pad to bring your knee down to, to find depth on your lunge or whatever. You have to ask your body to be less efficient and more intentional with every movement. Otherwise it's gonna naturally save you the energy and make your life easy. Life is easy if you live it the hard way. Life is hard if you live it the easy way. So we're trying to make sure that we're getting the most effortful movement, the most impactful movement, every set, every rep, every day. Yeah. <laughs>